Hi class, Dr. Jim here. We're now starting to look at the individual systems. And so today is a really important lecture looking at how animals, animals themselves, and so really the vertebrates, but we're gonna talk about other animals as well, how we are able to conserve water. And so one of the biggest problems we have being on land is not having water surround us. And so how do we manage making sure that we don't dry up, that we don't become dehydrated because water is always being evaporated from our bodies and really we're trying to minimize as much water loss as possible. And so that's the biggest thing. And so today we're gonna to look at the excretion system of animals. And again, we're gonna look at why these things are so important because again, if we lose all our water, we're in really big trouble. And so this kind of goes along with what we talked about earlier in chapter 32, looking at uh, thermal regulation and regulation of the endocrine system and some of these other things. And so what this is looking at specifically is how do animals regulate the water loss or water intake and water loss. And again, it all evolves around the excretion system. Now in humans, again, we have our kidneys. The kidneys play a big role in filtering our blood and again, production of urine, which then travels down the ureter to the bladder and then finally out the urethra. In other animals like insects and that, they really don't have a set of kidneys, but what they have are these things called Melpigian tubules, which help pull out uh, different nutrients out of the hemocyl, which is kind of the fluid that surrounds their body. They pull out these nutrients and that stuff that they don't need or waste and toxins and that stuff, especially ammonia and that, and it really comes out really dry. And what they secrete out is dry waste, including uric acid. And so again, ammonia is always the biggest issue in any of these things. And again, looking at other animals, very similar when we look at other animals like uh, vertebrates, again, kidneys, ureters, the bladder, and urethra, and again, the kidneys work the same way. And we're going to talk about why uh, vertebrates or mammals in general have, have become so successful on land because of the development of these kidneys. In order to survive on land, you need to minimize your water loss. And so either you're going to be attached to the water and stuck with the water like amphibians, where again, they have rudimentary kidneys and that stuff, and they work pretty well. But again, they have to be in very moist environments where mammals have evolved enough so that we really don't need um, a source of water close by. Obviously, we need to drink water and do those different things, but we're, we're not dependent on water as much as, say, a fish or amphibian is uh, since we're now on land. And so we'll look at some of the reasons why that is today. So again, we're going to talk about what, is, what type of osmoregulation systems do animals have. And again, osmoregulation is controlling the amount of water and water loss. And we'll look at that. So we're going to go back to osmosis again and look at all that good stuff. And then we're going to look at the, is, is there a difference between marine, freshwater, and terrestrial animals and how they deal with water loss? And you're going to see there is a big difference in what type of minerals you have and all those different things. And then finally, like I said before, how have mammals adapted their kidneys to be on land? And so we're going to really take a close look at not only the humans, but again, really at all mammals and even focus in on a little of those that grow in or that grow that live in very uh, warm, dry environments like the desert and see what they do differently uh, to conserve water, because that is always the issue when we're talking about living on land and especially dry environments. So today we're going to look at, again, looking at osmoregulation. And again, this is the ability to uh, manage your water loss. And so osmoregulation is a general term in which animals control their solute concentrations. And again, it's a balance of water gain and loss. And again, there are several mechanisms involved in excretion uh, that uh, look at this to get rid of uh, nitrogenous metabolites. And so, like I said, in insects, they pretty much uh, produce a dry waste, looking, uh, making uric acid. Whereas in humans, we, we produce urine. And again, it has um, uh, urea and some other things in it. And so we'll take a look at some of these different structures as we go along. Now, osmolarity is the concentration of solute in a solution. And again, it is looking at how water moves across the membrane. And so this is getting back to the early original um, osmosis moving to water. And so the one golden rule that you have to remember is water is always going to move toward the solute and the solute could be anything. Typically, we always think of salt, but it could be really anything. You could talk about sugar, molasses, you know, proteins, uh, nucleic acids, anything that's a solute is dissolved in water. Now, water is always going to try and equal everything out. In biology, we always want to make everything equal. And so whenever you think about these situations, we want to make sure that we try to get to an isoosmotic solution. And so again, 
what happens here in this example here is that water is always going to move from a place where you have lower solute concentration to higher solute concentration. And so because water wants to dissolve the solute to get these two sides equal. And so that's the idea in this situation. Now we have, um, again, some organisms that are called osmoconformers, meaning that they uh, basically adjust to their environment. So if they're in a really freshwater place or non-salty place, they adjust their bodies to that. Whereas if they're in a very salty place, they can adjust their systems. An example of an osmoconformer would be a jellyfish. And again, they're very simple animals and they can adjust their, their concentration or salt concentrations based on the environment they're in. Now, most higher level animals are going to be osmoregulators where they can adjust how much water they take in or take out based on the environment. And so they adjust it already. They have essentially the ability to adjust to whatever environment they are and keep it at the same level. And that would be an osmoregulator. And again, they either take up more water when they need it, if they're in a hypoosmotic situation or lose water if they're in a hypoosmotic solution. And so that's the idea in these situations. Now, marine and freshwater organisms have opposite challenges. And so if you have a marine fish, so this is how osmoregulation works in a marine fish. So this is a saltwater. Water, these fish always have to constantly drink water because what's happening is they're constantly trying losing water. Because in marine water, there's more solute outside than inside the body. So water wants to go out. It wants to de dehydrate the animal. So the fish has to constantly take in, in water. And if it doesn't take in enough water, it's going to eventually die. And so the way that it regulates it is, again, uh, not only does it gain water from salt ions in the food, but it also gains water by drinking seawater. Then what happens is they secrete ions out to keep the water in. And then again, the biggest issue they have is uh, a lot of osmotic water loss through gills and other parts of the body because water wants to escape. It wants to go into the direction of where the salt is. Big thing with saltwater fish is that they don't secrete very much water from their urethra because their kidneys, again, are balanced enough to make sure that most of the water stays inside so they don't secrete a lot of water. And so they're not going to pee a lot. If, if you want to look at it that way in the general term, a saltwater fish is not going to pee a lot because they want to conserve as much water as possible. They're already losing it through their skin. Now, freshwater fish is the opposite. Most of the salt is inside the animal, so all the water is going to rush in. And if they don't control it, they're going to blow up. And so in these cases, they, they basically don't really drink water because water's coming in and doing those things. So they're uptaking salts and ions through food, in through their gills, and then again, water is trying to come in. Now they're going to excrete a lot of water because again, water's keeping in. So they're going to be excreting a large amount of uh, water and again, very dilute because they want to keep the salt in because again, that's going to keep them from or excretion of salt and large amounts of water to dilute the urine and dilute urine because again, they want to get rid of the water. Water's trying to come in because it's trying to dilute them. And again, that could cause them to explode. So they got to really pump that out. So freshwater fish is going to pee a lot if, if you look at it that way. And so again, that's the idea. Saltwater fish, they want to keep as much water in because they're losing a ton of water. Freshwater fish are trying to push as much water out because they're gaining water all the time. And so that's the difference. And that's what would happen if you took a saltwater fish and now put it into freshwater, they would actually, in this case, blow up because they're they're drinking a bunch of water and they would just swallow up like a balloon. And the same thing would happen to freshwater fish. They're used to getting rid of the water. Now they would really dehydrate and that would not be a good thing either. So you never want to mix these two up. And so again, it's due to their uh, freshwater or again, those kidneys. Now, land animals have mechanisms to prevent dehydration. Some of this is the body covering. So on lizards and that stuff and mammals and that stuff, you have skin, which is characterized, minimize water loss. A lot of animals have scales to prevent water loss and they drink water and eat moist foods and they also produce water metabolically. So when they go through and do you know AP, ATP production and that stuff, they make a lot of molecular water as a process of making ATP. So splitting the oxygen and making water is also important as well. Okay, so again, getting as much water as they possibly can. Now, the other issue that animals have is nitrogenous waste. And this is due to the breakdown of proteins and amino acids and nucleic acids and nitrogenous bases. So eating itself 
we eat a lot of protein, we make a lot of nitrogenous waste. And so in order to get rid of that, we have to do something with that. And so again, not only proteins, but also nucleic acids have lots of nitrogen in them. And so the organism cells have to get rid of the nitrogenous waste. So there's one of, one of three ways that animals get rid of it. They convert it to, again, some type of ammonia or ammonia group, and then get rid of it to excrete. So the first group is the, uh, again, aquatic animals that will secrete ammonia. So just NH3, make it very easy. Uh, most birds and reptiles and insects and other land animals will secrete uric acid, which is a very complex molecule. Again, and then for the mammals, amphibians and sharks and some bony fishes, we, we basically secrete urea in the form of urine and that stuff. And again, we'll look at how the kidney works here in a little while, but these are really the main nitrogenous pro pro um, products we make to get rid of the nitrogen. And so again, because nitrogen can be very toxic in that stuff, so we have to um, get it out of our bodies. And so pneumonia can be toxic to the body. So the quicker we can get rid of it, the better off we are. And so that's the key. Uh, whenever we think about excretion, it's not only uh, keeping the water, but getting rid of the toxins that are in, in the body. Now, like I said, ammonia excretion is the most common in aquatic environments. Most terrestrial animals secrete urea. And again, it's a conversion product ammonia, which is much less toxic. So again, we can hold it in our bladder and it doesn't cause as many problems. And then insects, land snails, and reptiles, including birds, secrete uric acid, which is a semi-solid paste. So the bird poop you actually get is not only food, but it is also their uh, nitrogenous waste. And so that's the paste that you see associated with that. And so again, all these things are less toxic than ammonia and it generates very little water loss, but it is energetically more expensive because then uh, doing that to produce, uh, because again, you have to go and convert it all. And so that's the problem. You get this ammonia byproduct and then you got to convert it into either uric acid or urea, which is more expensive than just secreting out ammonia in these situations. Okay. Now, in most animals, osmoregulation and metabolic waste disposal rely on transport epithelia. And so, again, these are cells that help move things across membranes. And so that's going to be the key step. So when we talk about blood and capillaries, again, you're going to have these solutes going across the, the movement along with water. And that's where you're going to see this. And again, these cells are um, specialized for moving uh solutes across in controlled amounts across specific things and so they have carrier proteins and all these other things really built built in so that they can secrete and transport nutrients one way or the other and so this is what we see especially in kidneys so you can see here sodium going in and out associated with potassium and then sodium and glucose coming out through the tubular fluid and that and so we'll look at all this stuff when we look at the kidneys here in a few minutes uh, when we look at it Okay, now the excretion, uh, excretory system of animals. Again, many animals uh, series or species produce uh, fluid waste uh, by refining filtrate of derived fluids. And so again, the idea is to filter. So you filter the body fluids. And so what happens is the blood comes in, you filter, the blood runs along. And so during this time, what you have is a number of different things. You have reabsorption and secretion from the blood. And so again, reclaiming valuable solutes, that's the reabsorption part. And then secretion is getting more non-essential solutes and waste from the body fluids into the filtrate. And then finally, excretion, which is getting the nitrogenous uh, waste from the body. And so we'll talk about this. The other key aspect of all this is minimize the amount of water you lose during this. And so we try and reabsorb as much water as possible uh, in the filtrate. And you're going to see we really ramp up uh, the concentration of a lot of these solutes during the process of filtration and secretion and reabsorption. And so you'll see this where certain things are reabsorbed because they're really necessary. Other things are secreted back in. And again, you're going to see the concentration of the solute go up where, again, because we lose a lot of the water as we filtrate because it's very important we bring that back into the blood in these situations. Now, if we look at invertebrates, they have a very simple system uh, called uh, pro, uh, protonephridia, which essentially is these uh, tubules connected to inner openings. And so the best example of the photonephridia is in these wonderful planaria. And what they have are these tubes all the way around. And again, these are freshwater. So water's constantly coming in and they've got to excrete it out. So what they do is they essentially have these cilia and other things that will take the interstitial fluid, 
convert it over, transport it out, and then pipe it through these tubes, which they'll excrete out through the external environment. And so they make a very dilute uh, urine uh, because, again, they got to get as much water out because they're in a freshwater environment. Water's coming in to try and dilute them out, so they got to excrete as much water out as possible. So these animals would not survive without an exc excretory system because they just get big and bloated and eventually blow up because they, they can't deal with all the fresh water that they that they live in. And so that's the key that they got to get. They have to have good excretion systems to get the water out. Now in insects, because they're on land, again, they want to minimize the amount of water. So again, the big thing is the nitrogenous uh, products. And so again, the male piggy and tubules, which are associated right around the mid gut and that will remove any of the digestive waste and nitrogen that's in the fluid filled coelom. And again, these things again will bring the ammonia and other things and then they'll convert it into uric acid and then it's all secreted out the same opening as the dry waste with the rectum and so again when they poop they're essentially expelling out their uric acid as well so the dry paste and this is the same very similar now birds don't have male piggy and tubules but they do make uric acid and that and also in reptiles and so they have one excretion system along with the one digestive uh, exit, which is the anus. And so in birds and in reptiles, they just have what is called the cloaca and they expel out all their uh, dry urine or uric acid as well as their uh, food waste as well in these situations. Okay, now invertebrates, again, invertebrate animals, uh, again, some slight differences, like I said, birds and reptiles are a little bit different, but invertebrates we have in other chordates, we have the kidneys, which function both in osmoregulation and excretion. And again, it consists of tubules arranged and organized in an array with a network of capillaries. And then the excretory system includes ducts and other structures that carry urine out of the body. And so in the human, we have the kidneys. They're, can, uh, again, uh, emptied out through the ureter. That goes to the urinary bladder and finally excreted out through the urethra and then out of the body. And in, again, upper, upper vertebrates in mammals, they have two openings, again, except for the duckbill platypus, which has the cloaca, but in everything else, all the other animals have uh, both an anus and then a urethra in, in those situations. And so you'll see that as we get into the further animals, except like I said, the, the birds, the birds, the reptiles and the frogs. But again, mammals pretty much all have that where they have the two openings in this case. So again, when you look at the kidney structure, the, the kidney has the two parts. You have the renal cortex and the renal medulla. And this is the series of tubules in here. And we'll talk a little bit more about what's going on. You also have these capillaries around it. And then you have the renal pelvis, which is basically the collection, the collecting ducts of the, again, the uh, renal medulla, which collects the fluid and then works its way to the ureter and then it empties out into the bladder where the urine is held. Now inside the renal cortex, you can see that you have these tubules and then the medulla has the uh, loop of Henle, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And then they have the tubules descending down into the, uh, the, the, jun the junction down here. And again, we'll look at that as we, we talk about that. And so these are the nephrons and these nephrons are necessary for filtering and, and getting rid of the the nitrogenous waste and we'll look at that as well as reabsorption of water so we'll take a look at that as well now this kind of gives you an idea of what the nephron looks like so again you have the collecting duct which then works its way out to the ureter and that stuff but what you have here is essentially this capsule and this is called the Bauman's capsule and essentially this is where the capillary will filter all the different things out out of that the fluid and the solutes out of the blood in this case then it gets into the proximal tubule and then it works in the loop of Henle, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And then it works its way around and then finally ends up in the collecting duct. The reason why you have both capillaries and this loop of Henle is very important for, again, the two parts, the reabsorption of solutes and then also the um, movement of other solutes and waste into the cat into the uh, loop and so we'll take a look at this as well as getting water out so that will be the other other part so again getting as much water out of the kidney or out of or keeping the water I should say out of the urinary system and getting most of the water out and making sure it goes to the right spot okay 
So again, the, the mammalian kidney's ability to conserve water is the key to terrestrial adaptation. Again, the basic unit of the mammalian kidney is the nephron. And in the human kidney, filtrate forms when the fluid passes from the bloodstream into the lumen of the Bauman's capsule. So that's where the initial fluid goes into the nephron. And then what you're going to see is then going through. Roughly 1,600 liters of blood flows through a pair of kidneys every day. So that's a lot of blood. So your blood gets recirculated all the time. And when your kidneys don't work, then you have to get dialysis, which does the work of your kidneys. And so again, filtering your blood, yielding about 180 liters of initial filtrate. So we don't pee 180 liters every day. So you're going to see a lot of this gets reabsorbed into the body. And so you find out 99% of the water and nearly all the sugars, amino acids, vitamins, and other organic nutrients are reabsorbed in the blood. What gets released are the nitrogenous wastes, some salts, uh, and then a little bit of water, and that's what you see. But because of this, I mean, this filter system is so important for life on land because we retain 99% of our water. And so, again, if we didn't have this, we'd be really in trouble. We'd have to be back in the water because we'd lose too much water being on land due to evaporation and other things that take place, and we'd be constantly drinking water to maintain the, the liquid that we need, the water inside of our cells that we need. Now, again, it all starts with the proximal tubule and the Bowman's capsule. So the capillary comes in and you can see a lot of the filtrate along with all the dissolved solutes in this case are released into this tubule. And so you can see these numbers represent the amount or the concentration of solutes in this case. And you're going to see the numbers fluctuate as we go along in these different things. So in the proximal tubule, you start to see nutrients uh, come in and out based on what is needed. Now certain nutrients are required along with water is being pulled out and you start to see that again certain ammonia and other things are added in. So again this is where that um, filtration starts to take place. Protons and ammonia are added in while certain nutrients and other things that are important are filtered out. Okay, and so that's the proximal tubule. And again, these things, some toxic materials are actually actively secreted into the filtrate to get rid of the toxins as well. Now we get into what is called the descending limb of the loop of Henle. So this is the loop of Henle right here. And again, this is important for, again, maintaining water balance. And so this is going to be the big thing. So when you see the descending loop, uh, our limb of the loop of Henle, you're going to see a lot of water come out. This is where a lot of reabsorption of water as well as some solutes are taking place. And again, it's because the concentration is going up, water is being pulled through into the kidney in this case. And what you're seeing is because the water is being pulled out, the solute concentration is going up. And so again, you see this number. Okay, And so reabsorption of water occurs through aquaporin uh, protein channels. The movement is driven by the high osmolarity of the interstitial fluid, which is hyperosmotic to the filtrate. So again, more solute out here than in here because of the nutrients in that. So that's pulling the water out passively through osmosis. And again, the filtrate becomes increasingly uh, concentrated as it works its way down because more water is getting pulled out. Okay, so that's the descending limb. Now it makes the return and goes up called the ascending limb. And so again, this is called the ascending limb uh, uh, the loop of Henley and again in those these lack water channels so water doesn't escape now but what you're seeing is urea and salts being pulled out in this case but salt salt but not the water is able to move from the tubule into the interstitial fluid so you can see here salt is being pulled out because of the high concentration of salt so that's being allowed to go through and then also what you're seeing is urea being pulled in so the, the solute concentration actually goes down because of the salt concentration but what you're seeing is, is that other things are going in and water can't leave. And so now it becomes more dilute as you're working on because you have more water in this and less salt in these situations. So first pulls out the water, then concentration concentrates the urine, and then more salt gets pulled out at this indication. But the other things that's, that stay are the waste products. And so you're getting rid of the waste but maintaining both the salt and water in these situations to help with this process. Now we get up to the distal tube, which is, again, next to the proximal tube. And now you see more salt being pulled out, more water being pulled out. And then you get potassium hydro and, and proton ions in this case. And again, concentrations regulates those concentrations. And then the ions contributes to the pH regulation in this case so that it stays uh, neutral pH in this situation. Then you get the collecting duct where, again, more water and salts being pulled out, concentrating the urine as well as urea and other things. And so again, 
depending on a number of different things, the regulation of permeability uh, determines the concentration of urine. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about hormones. And again, it depends on how much water you drink, it depends on the concentration of urine. So the more water you have in you, the more likely you're gonna get rid of it because you don't wanna have too much water in your body. And again, the less water you have, the more concentrated your urine is gonna be. And you know this, you drink a lot of water during the day, your, your urine is very clear. When you don't drink a lot of water during the day and that stuff, and you've been working out and doing all those things, it comes out very yellow and very dark and almost almost an orangey color because it's so concentrated with nutrients and salts and other things like that, that again, it comes out a different color based on uh, the amount of water you have in your body at the time. So you know you're really dehydrated. This again just shows you the whole part of this and how this works. And again, it's a constant uh, pulling in reabsorption of water, reabsorption of salt and nutrients, and then pulling that out and concentrating it to get the waste out. So the idea is maintaining the solute, uh, the solute of salt and water in the kidney and getting that out of the filtrate, but putting the um, waste products in. And so that's gonna be the key, making higher concentrations and that stuff, the higher concentrations are gonna allow for, again, the, um, for the movement of water one way or the other in these cases. And again, biggest thing is the loss of the waste. And so even some drugs and that stuff, we know pass through the kidney pretty quickly in that stuff. Now the mammalian kidneys ability to conserve water is the key for terrestrial adaptation. And again, the looping Henle, loop of Henle and the surrounding capillaries act as a counter current system, meaning that they're pulling water out and then you're multiplying the solute concentration. So the system involves active transport, thus an expenditure of in, uh, energy. And again, this system is called a countercurrent multiplier system because essentially what you're doing is pulling water out through osmosis and active transport of the salt. But what you're doing is you're collecting and collecting the waste products and just allowing yourself to conserve the water and salt but get rid of the waste products and those things. And so this capillary, the vasa recta, kind of goes along with the loop of Henle, and you can see where things are being pulled in and pulled out uh, during this. And that's why it's called a countercurrent, because you're pulling things out and adding things back in all the time as it passes around these systems. Now, variations in nephron structure and function equip the uh, kidneys of uh, different vertebrates uh, for osmoregulations. One of the big differences is the desert-dwelling mammals. How do they um, do this? And so, again, they're going to have the most hyperosmotic urine, meaning they're going to have the most salt uh, in those because they want to conserve as much water as possible because where they're losing their water is through evaporation the most where they're losing it, whereas an animal like a cow which is in not a uh, hyperosmotic environment is gonna lose most of their water through urine, even though they have it. The big difference is the nephron. If you see the nephron in the desert animals, they're gonna have much longer nephrons to pull out more water and more salts and get more waste into concentrate it than you're gonna see in a uh, nephron in a cow or something that doesn't have that's not in a desert environment. Because again, water loss is not as critical in these animals as it is in a desert animal. You need all the water you can get. So they're gonna have the most dilute, or I'm sorry, the most uh, uh, osmotic, hyperosmotic urine in these animals, more water retention, and then less water retention in those that are in normal environments, if that makes sense. So animals that are not in desert environments are gonna let more water go because they don't need to worry about as much water loss in that. Whereas desert animals, water is the key. And so you wanna lose as few as little water as possible. And so you can see the difference in where water loss actually takes place. So in this desert rat, most of their water loss is gonna be through evaporation, not through, not through urine or feces. Whereas in a terrestrial cow, most of it is actually through urine loss in this case, and not so much evaporation. Okay, so other mammals can control the volume and osmolarity of urine, again, through the kidneys and the length of the kidneys. Kidneys of the South American vampire bat can produce either very dilute or very concentrated urine depending on the water quality. And again, this allows for bats to reduce their body weight rapidly or digest large amounts of protein while conserving water. And again, the key is protein, again, when you break down proteins, you produce that ammonia waste and you gotta get rid of it. And so that's one of the big parts of not only osmoregulation, but also eliminating the ammonia waste. And so that's the key in those situations. So you wanna remove that ammonia waste. Okay, now we do have homeostatic regulation. This is uh, one of those things. And so our bodies, our hormones can control how much, uh, again, how much urine we're gonna produce. And one of those things looks at 
again, the hormonal inputs and outputs of kidneys. And again, this contributes to homeostasis for blood pressure and volume. One of the things you can regulate is calcium in the, in the body. And so again, depending on what happens in these situations, falling blood calcium levels cause the kidneys to uptake more calcium. And again, more calcium release from bones. And then as you eat more, then that lowers and then this all goes down. And so you can see that just on the uh, regulation of calcium. Now, other ways that we can regulate uh, our, our, our volumes is by using hormones. And again, the antidiuretic hormone or EDH makes collecting the duct epithelium tempor temporary more permeable to water. So if we, and again, this is a good, good show, show much, uh, show what happens. And so this is the water content of our normal blood. If we have too much salt or we sweat a lot, then our water content goes low or dehydrated. Our brain will say, okay, we need to drink water. It will produce more ADH, which will cause for more absorption of water in our kidney and our urine output will be low. You probably don't pee very much during that day when you're sweating a lot or eating a lot of salty food or whatever. You don't pee as much. Now, let's say you now start drinking a lot of water and now you drink too much water. Now there's so much water in the blood that it's high. The brain will produce less ADH from the pituitary gland. And then what will happen is that now you'll have a lower volume of water uh, reabsorbed by the kidney. And so now the urine output would be high. And so now you produce more urine that way or maybe have to go to the bathroom more often because you drink a lot of water. And so again, this is one of the ways that we can regulate our bodies, our brains uh, figuring out how much water we need based on how much water is in our blood. So again, less water, more water is gonna be absorbed. The more uh, hydrated you are, the more likely you're going to um, have more water in the blood. So again, shutting the system down and then releasing more urine, so more water loss in that case. And that's kind of cool. So your system can regulate that going back and forth with the ADH. Now, there's also this renin angiotensin aldosterone system, or rather known as the RAS system, that regulates kidney function. And so, again, a drop in blood volume and pressure causes the RAS to increase water and sodium reabsorption to increase the pressure. The other thing that gets per, uh, produced is this peptide called angiotensin II, and it's a product of the RAS system. And so what happens is, again, ADH gets produced in the ELDO, and that says the kidney, okay, reabsorb the water and sodium. So you now get more blood volume and more cardiac output. That will increase the pressure, and that will also increase, and I learned this out, the systemic vascular retention, which is basically a higher blood pressure in that, and then again, vascular retention in your blood. So again, you'll have more uh, pressure and osmotic pressure going on. This is also triggered by this AI2, and then that can cause an increase in this pressure and blood volume in that. So you can see that you have multiple systems that are regulating the amount of water that's going in there. Now, some people have a problem where they produce too much A2, and then they get what is called hypertension because they have too much blood volume and cardiac output or too much uh, arterial pressure. So they have too much high blood pressure in this case. And so one of the drugs that they take actually blocks this AI2 production. And so that will lessen, lessen the amount of water in this case in the body. And so you're excreting more water in this case now, and you're lowering the blood pressure. So you probably didn't realize this, but your kidneys actually regula help regulate your blood pressure as well. So if you have good working kidneys, your blood pressure should be in a normal range. But if you eat too much salt and other things, that's why salt is bad for you because it affects the kidneys. Diabetes are bad because it affects the capillaries of the kidneys and that stuff. It destroys the kidneys over time. And so then you lose, and then you get these other complications like hypertension, high, high blood pressure, all these other things that cause some serious problems. And so that that's an issue. So like I said, angiotensin raises the blood pressure and decreases the blood flow to the capillaries and the kidneys. And then, like I said, if you have chronic high blood pressure, some of these drugs that we take actually will block this A A2 or this angiotensin 2. And because of that, it will cause the kidneys to uh, lower the amount of water tension and then lower the blood pressure. Because again, more water, less water in the blood, the blood pressure goes down. And so again, that gets it more into dehydration state. And so those that are in hypertension, a lot of times will then complain that they get thirsty a lot because of that and same with diabetes because you're getting more sugar in the blood and that stuff and that's a whole another another situation okay so it just shows you a little bit about in humans how we can regulate our kidneys and again how we can regulate the amount of water loss and water gain and osmoregulation in our bodies 
So we made it to the end of the video. Hopefully you learned a little bit about the kidneys today. I know I didn't get into too much, but it showed you a little bit of the differences between the vertebrate animals and how they secrete and that stuff. And you can see that the kidneys not only play a role in getting rid of waste, but they also play a role in osmoregulation. And that's what the first bullet point says, is that the shared system mediates osmoregulation and excretion in many animals. So again, the key is making sure that you maintain water. Being on land, one of our biggest problems is holding onto the water that we have. And so you don't want to lose that water through peeing it out and evaporation. So again, the kidneys make sure that we retain most of our water, that we don't urinate it all out, and that we're constantly having to drain water. So again, water gain and loss in cells, and then the ammonia, removal of ammonia. And that's, again, the breakdown of proteins and nucleic acids in the body producing this uh, nitrogenous waste. Okay, and then the mammalian kidneys, ability to conserve water is the key to terrestrial adaptation. It's a counter current multiplier. You saw as it went through the loop of Henle, it was pulling water out, increasing the solute concentration, then pulling the salts out, which is lowers the concentration, but you are also in gaining waste in those things in urea. And then the system kind of goes along and moving along these different concentration gradients. And so that's where the counter current uh, concentrations mean. And then again, the desert animals have the longer loops. You saw that they have longer to maintain, uh, to get more water out, so better water conservation. So again, in, in regular animals, they tend to have shorter loops of Henle than desert animals begin, because again, water loss. And so most of the water loss is through evaporation, not through urine excretion. And then regulation, uh, we saw with hormones, especially ADH, the brain can control how much our, our kidneys are reabsorbing water by how much water is in our body. So again, blood flow, if we have low water concentration in our blood, our body is going to say, okay, time to reabsorb more water, produce a more, uh, more solute or hyperosmotic urine in this case. If it's the opposite regulation where we have too much water in the body, the body is going to slow down to ADH, and then the water is going to be excreted more in the kidneys. And you guys know this. Like I said, if you just look at, you know, and they don't get into the bathroom humor and that stuff, but you know when you drink a lot of water, your urine is very clear or very dilute in that, in that case, whereas, um, or very diluted. In the case of when you don't drink a lot of water or you've been, you haven't drank a lot of water during the day and you may have been working out and that stuff and you already feel the taste of thirst and that, because that's another thing that gets triggered is your uh, thirst sensation goes up when it's a, and your body is saying, drink more water, drink more water. If you didn't drink enough water that day, your urine is very concentrated. It's going to be very yellow, almost like an orangey color. It's really diluted in that stuff. And that's because your body's trying to conserve as much water as possible. So it's a very concentrated urine. Okay, so hopefully you learned a little bit about the kidney today and that stuff. This kind of goes along, like I said, with the rest of Chapter 32, looking at uh, homeostasis and regulation and temperature regulation and that stuff. So it's kind of the, another contributor to that. But hopefully you got something out of it. If you do have any questions about the kidney or how we osmoregulate and that stuff or more explanation, please ask in class and that stuff. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.